Hi there, I'm John McAdams, founder of the Big Game Hunting blog. In this video, we're going to talk about everything 270 caliber. Now, while the United States is indeed a country where 30 caliber cartridges reign supreme, the 270 bore diameter and the accompanying 277 caliber bullets can actually really give the 30 caliber bore diameter a run for its money in terms of popularity here in North America and the USA. Indeed, the 270 can even be described as a uniquely American bore diameter, and as you will learn here shortly, I know of exactly seven cartridges using that 270 bore diameter. All of them are of American origin. So in this episode, I hit the highlights of all the 270 caliber SAMI certified cartridges and discuss their history, legacy, strengths and weaknesses, and their recommended uses in detail. Now, in addition to talking about these various cartridges, this video includes some photos of animals taken with these cartridges as well. Some are from me, others were submitted from the audience and used with their permission. Where applicable, details of the animal, rifle, cartridge, ammunition used, shot distance, things like that are all in the video description. So check that out if you wanna learn more. Now, I solicited photos from everyone on my email list as I was preparing for this video. If you would like to have the opportunity to contribute photos to a video in the future, make sure you are on my email list. To do that, click the link in the show notes or go to huntingguns101.com and sign up there for my free ebook on the best hunting cartridges. You'll get my free ebook when you do that, plus you'll also start to receive the emails I send out every weekday. These are entertaining and informative emails about hunting, shooting, ballistics, stuff like that. And I get feedback all the time from people telling me how much they look forward to hearing from me every day. So make sure you are getting them too by going to huntingguns101.com and signing up. Or by clicking the other link in the video description. Now, speaking of the video description, I have put links below the video to articles I've written about some of these cartridges, as well as some of my favorite pieces of hunting gear, like slings, ear protection, rifles, scopes, stuff like that. So check that stuff out too for more content. And finally, make sure you hit that subscribe button below the video to make sure you don't miss out on any of my future videos. And make sure you hit the bell so you get a notification when I release new stuff too. Okay, let's get started talking about these 270 caliber cartridges today. Now, in this particular episode, instead of starting from least powerful and working our way up to more powerful like I did in the 30 caliber episode, I think it makes a little bit more sense to start with the oldest cartridge and then work our way forward in time to the present day. So with that in mind, let's go all the way back in time to 1925 where it all began for the 270 caliber with the granddaddy of them all the 270 Winchester. Now the 270 Winchester is basically a 30-06 case neck down to shoot .277 caliber bullets. Now why the heck the folks at Winchester chose to use 277 caliber bullets is anybody's guess. There are a few theories out there, but nobody really knows for certain what their methodology was for choosing that bullet size today. Now, 7mm or .284 caliber bullets were in somewhat common use then. The same was also true with 6.5mm or .264 caliber bullets. But for some reason, Winchester went with .277 caliber bullets here that are .013 inches or 13 one thousandths of an inch larger than 6.5mm bullets but 0 0.007 inches, or 7 one thousandths of an inch, smaller than 7 millimeter bullets. So right in the middle there. Craig Bonington wrote an article many years ago where he tried unsuccessfully to get to the bottom of this question. Though, even though he didn't solve the question or answer the question definitively, he came up with a couple of possibilities. Now, one common theory as to why the folks at Winchester chose this specific bore diameter was they chose to use the same bore diameter as the obscure 6.8 by 57 millimeter Chinese Mauser that saw a little bit of use before World War I. However, that cartridge is obscure with a capital O, and Boddington says he's never even been able to turn up a photo of that cartridge. Really, the only reason anyone ever talks about it today is to talk about the origins of the 270 Winchester bore diameter. 
Now, with that in mind, Boddington also relayed the theory, others have posited, that Winchester wanted to build a new cartridge based off of the 30-06 with a smaller bore diameter, but they wanted to build that new cartridge with a uniquely American bullet diameter. And they avoided using 6.5 millimeter and 7 millimeter bullet sizes, specifically because those bullet sizes were popular in Europe. Remember, this all took place in the early 1920s after World War I ended, and the United States was getting used to its new place in the world after that horrible conflict finished. Now, additionally, Boddington also pointed out what others have noticed about the 277 bullet diameter. If you multiply 0.9 times 0.308, you get 0.277. Now, maybe the folks at Winchester were trying to make a statement by building a cartridge with a bullet diameter 90% the size of that used by the 30-06. Or maybe, since there doesn't seem to be any marketing materials or even private notes to that effect, at least that anyone has found and published, maybe this was just more of an engineering goal, right? They the folks at Winchester knew they wanted something smaller than a .308 caliber bullet, and they didn't want a .264 or a .284 caliber bullet, so somebody took 90% of .308 as a benchmark, and they rolled with it. Regardless of exactly how they got there, the .270 was born, though. By necking down the .30-06 to shoot smaller diameter .277 caliber bullets, this new cartridge could shoot lighter bullets at a faster velocity with a correspondingly flatter trajectory, and generate less recoil in the process. That original 270 Winchester load shot a 130 grain bullet at a blazing fast velocity, especially for 1925, of 3,140 feet per second. That's about 28 50 foot pounds of energy. Now, the 270 was not the first widely commercially available cartridge to break the 3,000 foot per second mark. No, that honor belonged to Charles Newton's 250 3,000 Savage that came along in 1915 which could fling an 87-grain bullet at 3,000 feet per second. Now, that was amazing performance in 1915. Now, the 270 Winchester was physically much larger than the 250 Savage, but it just blew it away in terms of performance, and the 270 could shoot a bullet that was 43 grains heavier over 100 feet per second faster than the 250 Savage. Now, as you might expect, the 270 did gain a reputation for being very effective on thin-skinned game, especially stuff like white-tailed deer. It wasn't all sunshine and roses, though. The 270 was pushing some pretty lightly constructed bullets at lightning-fast velocities for the time, and some hunters began to complain about it being a quote-unquote wounder and or for producing large amounts of bloodshot meat on game. I'm not going to say it was a super controversial cartridge, because some, some hunters really liked it, other people didn't. But it definitely had a little bit of controversy and it was a, a contention surrounding it, especially during its earlier days. It is funny to me, though, how things like that get forgotten over time. Because the 270 certainly does not have that sort of reputation today. And even among people that don't necessarily like it or you know wouldn't say it's their favorite cartridge... I don't think it gets a lot of hate, and it's not considered very quote-unquote controversial right now either. In any case, Tyler Friel republished an article Jack O'Connor wrote in 1954 about the 270, relating some complaints and commentary other hunters had about the 270 at the time. Now, Tyler thought it was pretty funny, and he remarked that what other people were saying back then about the 270 sounds a lot like how people today talk about the 6.5 Creedmoor. Do an internet search of... The 270 was your grandpa's 6.5 Creedmoor, and you will probably turn up that article he wrote. Now, in that vein, no discussion of the 270 is complete without mentioning either Jack O'Connor or the Winchester Model 70. Jack O'Connor had many rifles in many different chamberings. He hunted with a lot of different stuff. But he is most commonly associated with a Winchester Model 70 rifle chambered in 270 Winchester, and he used that rifle to hunt all sorts of game. I highly recommend visiting the Jack O'Connor Museum in Lewiston, Idaho, where you can see some of his firearms in taxidermy for yourself. I went many years ago back when I lived in Washington, and I'm really glad I did. That was a pretty cool experience. Now, among other things, if you go there, you can see his favorite rifle. Now, that rifle was a Winchester Model 70 Featherweight N270 purchased in Lewiston in 1959. 
It was custom stocked by Al Beeson of Spokane, who also fitted an engraved trap door butt plate and grip cap. That rifle was used by Jack from Botswana to British Columbia on a variety of game to include his last stone sheep in 1973. Now, with regards to rifles, the 270 originally hit the market at the same time as the Winchester Model 54 rifle. That was itself a great rifle, and their simultaneous introduction likely enhanced the reputation of both the Model 54 and the 270 cartridge. Now, like I have mentioned previously, it is very interesting to me how quite often what we consider to be legendary cartridges today were introduced in conjunction with a really great rifle. The 30-06 in the 1903 Springfield is a great example. So is the Remington Model 700 with the 7mm Remington Magnum. Well, the Winchester Model 54 and the 270 Winchester are another good example of that phenomenon. Now, Winchester also offered the 270 as one of the original chamberings for the Model 70 rifle, when that rifle came on the scene in 1936. Only the .30-06 was a more popular chambering in the Model 70, and according to Wayne Van Zwoll in the Nosler 9th edition reloading manual, fully 20% of all the Winchester Model 70s produced before 1963 were chambered in .270 Winchester. And of course, Winchester still makes Model 70 rifles chambered in .270 Winchester to this day. The same is actually true of basically any rifle you can think of from darn near any manufacturer. Now, I mentioned that the original ballistics of the cartridge were a 130 grain bullet at 3,140 feet per second. That is fast, especially for a lightweight cup and core bullet. I have no doubt that it was supremely effective on thin-skinned game. But I also have no doubt that hunters experienced their share of bullet failures on it, too. Now, I would not want to have a 130 grain cup and core bullet in my magazine if I got an 80 yard shot on an elk that was strongly quartering to me. Now, I'm not exactly sure why, but Winchester backed off their original loadings and a 130 grain bullet at 3,060 feet per second is a more typical factory load today. Now, bullet weights normally top out at around 150 grains for most factory loads, and the 270 will push those weight bullets around 28, 2900 feet per second. So, for instance, Winchester now offers the 270 in 130 grain and 150 grain versions in their PowerPoint line. Uh, 130 grain PowerPoint at 3060 feet per second for about 2700 foot pounds of energy and 150 grain PowerPoint at 2,850 feet per second for also just over 2,700 foot-pounds of energy. Now, many other companies make 270 Winchester factory ammo, just like the case with rifles. Darn near any ammunition manufacturer makes at least some 270 factory loads as well. Among other companies, Nosler does too. They offer it um, with, among other loads from Nosler, with 150 grain partition at 2,800 feet per second for just over 2,600 foot-pounds of energy. Going back to the example I made just a second ago of a strongly quartering two presentation on an elk at close range, there's a gigantic difference between 130 grain power point and a 150 grain partition. And I would not want to have that 130 grain PowerPoint in my magazine under the, under those conditions, but I would not hesitate one bit to take that shot with that 150 grain partition, though. Now, I am not sure why Winchester and the other companies backed off their factory loads from 3,140 feet per second to 3,060 feet per second. Um, some people, like Chuck Hawks, have theorized that they did that in order to quote-unquote handicap the 270 a little bit to make some of their magnum cartridges like the 264 Win Mag, the 7 Rim Mag, and the 300 Win Mag a little bit more appealing to people. Uh, so like I said, I don't know why they did that. That may be why, uh, but maybe they realized they were exceeding their pressures or something like that when they were doing it. But whatever the case is, for the most part, that 3,060 feet per second with a 130 grain bullet is a very standard factory load right now. That said... Some cartridges lend themselves very well uh, to quote unquote improvements by hand loaders. The 270 is one of those cartridges. I have several reloading manuals, and all of them list safe published hand loads for the 270 that will easily exceed that 3,060 feet per second 
velocity with a 130 grain bullet and approach and sometimes even exceed that original standard of 3,140 feet per second with that 130 grain bullet that the 270 was originally introduced with. Now, you can't do that with every cartridge as far as exceeding what you can get with uh, factory ammo safely anyway, but the 270 is one of those cartridges that, like I said, lends itself to that use pretty darn well. So do what you will with that information. Now, that 150 grain partition load is superb for use on bigger game. I would not hesitate one second to use that load on any species of game in the world short of Cape Buffalo. Elk, moose, kudu, eland, wildebeest, no problem. I am sure it would work fine on a big brown bear or grizzly bear, too. Email me, john at thebiggamehuntingblog.com, if you have used a 270 on something really, really big, like one of the big bears. I would love to talk to you about that in more detail. Now, a friend of mine is a big fan of the 270, and he is the sort of guy hunting guides like to see when he arrives in camp. He has an old and clearly well-used but well-cared-for Ruger M77 in 270. He uses that rifle for everything. He's taken a couple moose with it, same with caribou, God knows how many deer. He's even taken it to Africa and has used it to make some one-shot kills on Impala, Zebra, Blue Wildebeest, and Kudu. He used 150 grain partitions for most of those bigger animals to include everything in Africa and one of the moose. He likes 130 grain bullets for deer. He used 150 grain Acubon long range on his most recent moose because he couldn't get the partitions due to the ongoing ammo shortage. Let's just say the results from those 150 grain Acubon long range bullets from Nosler were impressive on the moose. That moose was quartering towards him at about 300 yards. He said the bullet punched straight through the shoulder blade, shredded his vitals. He said the bull staggered, turned, gave him a broadside shot, during which he put another bullet through the lungs, and then the elk, or excuse me, the moose collapsed. You can't ask for much more than that. For reference, Nosler lists a muzzle velocity of 2,850 feet per second for their 150 grain Acubon long-range factory loads. That gives you just over 2,700 foot-pounds of energy. And yes, they load that load with the Acubon long range bullets a little bit hotter than their 150 grain partition loads. But in any case, we will reference that load for the Acubon long range, 150 grain bullet, 2,850 feet per second. We're going to reference that multiple times in this episode. Now, just like with rifles, you can get darn near every type of ammo you can think of in 270 Winchester 2. Winchester PowerPoint, Remington Core Lock, Federal Power Shock, Federal Fusion. Lots of stuff from Hornady, lots of stuff from Nosler, stuff from Barnes. Basically, any company that makes centerfire rifle ammo makes 270 Winchester ammo. And that cartridge is definitely in the top 10 most popular cartridges in use in the USA. So you can find it darn near anywhere, too. There is lots to love about the 270 Winchester, and a hunter could reasonably use it on literally any species of game in the world this side of Cape Buffalo and Elephant. Plus, it does all that with less recoil than the 30-06. Yes, it is less powerful than the 30-06, but it still fits into that quote-unquote powerful enough category for most species of game, and that extra velocity could arguably make it an even better choice for use on thin-skinned game like white-tailed deer as well. We will discuss this in more detail later in the podcast, but probably the biggest complaint people have about the 270 these days and it is admittedly a minor complaint, is the standard 1 in 10 inch rifling twist rate of the cartridge is not compatible with some of the really long, sleek, high BC bullet designs that are becoming more popular. Sure, you can get that Acubon long range I just mentioned in 270. Same with stuff like the Barnes LRX, the Hornady ELDX. But those bullets have a noticeably lower BC in 277 caliber than the exact same bullet design does in 6.5 millimeter or 7 millimeter because of the rifling twist rate issues I just mentioned. For that reason, companies are starting to look into offering faster twist rates in modern production 270 rifles. For instance, Browning offers a couple models of their X-Bolt with a faster 1 in 8 inch or even 1 in 7.5 inch twist rate that will let it use some of the higher BC 277 caliber bullets that are starting to become available today. We'll discuss this a little bit more later in the episode. Most hunters won't need a rifle like that, but those developments are also a good sign that, regardless of what new and hot cartridges hit the market, 
the 270 is probably here to stay, and that is a good thing. Now, the 270, the original 270 Winchester, hit the markets 1925. Not much happened otherwise on that bore diameter front until 1943 when the 270 Weatherby Magnum came along. Now, that was the first Weatherby cartridge. It was also the first 270 Magnum. It was also the first commercially successful belted Magnum. This cartridge was designed basically along the same lines as the 7 rim mag and the 300 wind mag that came along later. You take a 300 H&H case, blow it out, shorten it a little bit to fit in a standard length rifle action, neck it down to 277 caliber, and then give it the Weatherby signature double radius shoulder. Do all those things, boom, you got a 270 Weatherby cartridge. Now, unlike the 300 Weatherby, which is a magnum length cartridge. The 270 Weatherby is a shorter cartridge that fits in a standard length rifle action. Same as the original 270, same as the 30 6 Now, Weatherby introduced this cartridge 1943. It received formal SAMI approval 1994 with basically all of the other Weatherby cartridges that have been designed up to that point. This cartridge has a SAMI maximum average pressure of 62,500 PSI. Now, the 270 Weatherby Magnum was the 270 Magnum for many, many years. Roy Weatherby was a brilliant marketer. For instance, his rifles were themselves just beautiful works of art, and he made sure public figures like John Wayne, Chuck Yeager, guys like that, had examples of Weatherby rifles to hunt with themselves to further increase the cool factor of Weatherby rifles. Plus, those rifles were often chambered in Weatherby Magnum cartridges that had eye-popping ballistics. For instance, there's a load in the Barnes Vortex line, and this is actually an outlier with regular 270 Winchester factory ammo today, shooting a 130 grain TTSX at 3,140 feet per second for about 2,850 foot-pounds of energy. Now, that's a 270 Winchester loading. 130 grain bullet, 3,140. Well, Weatherby makes a 270 Weatherby Magnum factory load with that same 130 grain TTSX at 3,400 feet per second. That's delivering just over 3,300 foot pounds of energy. So, darn near 500 foot pounds of energy more than the 270 Winchester with the same bullet. In that same vein, Hornady makes a loading for the 270 Winchester 130 grain interlock at 3,060 feet per second for just over 2,700 foot-pounds of energy. Well, there's a Weatherby factory load for the 270 Weatherby, that same 130 grain interlock at 3,350 feet per second for 3,239 foot-pounds of energy. By the same token, Nosler makes that 150 grain Acubon long range loading at 2,850 feet per second for just over 2,700 foot pounds of energy for the 270 Winchester. Well, Nosler also makes a loading with that same 150 grain Acubon long range at 3,080 feet per second for 3,159 foot pounds of energy for the 270 Weatherby. Now, it shoots that 150 grain Acubon long range faster than typical 270 Winchester factory loads will push a 130 grain bullet. It's only a little bit faster than those 130 grain factory loads, but it is faster. With the same weight bullet, you're looking at a velocity improvement or velocity advantage for the 270 Weatherby of 230 to 290 feet per second faster than the 270 Winchester with those loads I just talked about. So the 270 Weatherby has everything you liked about the 270 Winchester, but just more. Flatter trajectory, less wind deflection, more retained energy downrange. It has more, though I would not say excessive recoil, and more muzzle blast, things like that. Ammo is also more expensive too, and it's also not quite as easy to find. Now, most 270 Weatherby rifles have 26-inch barrels, so you need a longer barrel to take full advantage of the full potential of this cartridge. Uh, contrast that with 22 to 24 inch barrels being most common with the 270. Some do have longer barrels, but like I said, you buy just a random 270 Winchester rifle, it's going to have either a 22 or 24 inch barrel on it, probably. Like I said, too, the 270 Weatherby, you also just have to deal with more expensive, harder to find ammo. Now, Weatherby was the sole provider of both rifles and ammo for the cartridge for a long time. Since it became SAMI standardized in 1994, things have gotten a little better. But right now, as I record this in late 2023, Nosler is the only company I know of 
other than Weatherby to make factory uh, 270 Weatherby ammo in large quantities. Now, that said, boutique ammunition manufacturers like Hendershots and like Choice Ammunition do make 270 Weatherby ammo as well. Now, I also talked about ammo being more expensive. Well, here's a good example. I send an in-stock ammo email update to everyone on my email list every Friday. So that's another reason to join my email list. If you haven't already done so, click the link in the show notes and sign up there. And you'll start automatically receiving these emails when I send them out. But in any case, I was researching for one of my more recent ammo update emails, and I saw that I think it was Midway USA, at least when I was doing it, had some of that Nosler Trophy Grade long range ammo in stock for both the 270 Winchester and the 270 Weatherby. Well, that 270 Winchester ammo was $69.99. The 270 Weatherby ammo in that same line from the same company, $109.99. So there are definite advantages to going with the 270 Weatherby Magnum, but those are the downsides of doing so. Now, it's not the most popular Weatherby cartridge. If the 300 Weatherby is the most popular Weatherby cartridge right now, I think the 257 Weatherby is probably next. Maybe the 270 Weatherby is after that. Maybe the 460 Weatherby or one of the other cartridges is more popular. So it's a moderately popular Weatherby Magnum cartridge. The good news is that Weatherby will likely always support the 270 Weatherby Magnum cartridge. So you can, if if nowhere else, you'll probably be able to get ammo from Weatherby. Same thing with rifles. So as long as Weatherby itself is in business, then shouldn't be an issue finding that stuff out there. Now, like was also the case to a smaller extent with the 270 Winchester when it was first released. The 270 Weatherby, since it is such a high-velocity cartridge, it is very rough on bullets. Now, a high-velocity cartridge shoots really fast, and it retains a lot of energy for a a longer-range shot on a game animal, a field. But your risk of bullet failure is increasing with close-range impacts with softer bullets. So for that reason... I advise going with the tougher bullets here with the 270 Weatherby, right? That 130 grain TTSX, that's a great choice for getting the most out of the 270 Weatherby under a variety of conditions and also not hampering yourself up close either. Now, really, all things considered, this cartridge, though it did improve on the original 270 Winchester, was not as big of a leap forwards in terms of extra performance compared to what the other Weatherby Magnums delivered, say the 300 Weatherby compared to like the 30-06 at the time, or even the 300 H&H. That was a big jump forward. The 270 Weatherby was a jump forward, but not as big of a jump. So for that reason, like I said, it just was never never a super popular Weatherby cartridge or never super duper popular among the hunting public at large. Additionally, this cartridge has some competition these days. Now, not much happened in the 270 space for a long time after the 270 Weatherby hit the shelves in the 1940s. That changed in 2002, though. Now, there was a new cartridge that hit the scene then called the 270 Winchester Short Magnum. This cartridge followed on the heels of the 300 Winchester Short Magnum. And it was basically just a 300 Winchester Short Magnum neck down to 270 caliber. Now, remember, the 270 Weatherby was the 270 Magnum for a long time. And people got to thinking, what if we could get that level of performance out of an even shorter package? Well, that's what they did with the 270 Winchester Short Magnum. This is a beltless cartridge with a slightly rebated rim. It means the rim is a little bit smaller in diameter than the case body. It's a very short and fat, yet very efficient cartridge. Now, as was the case with the 300 Winchester Short Mag. Some people say the 270 short mag is based on, some say it's inspired by the 404 Jeffrey cartridge. Either way, 404 Jeffrey has a slightly fatter body than even the belted portion of the 375 H&H Magnum. For this reason, you can get a larger diameter container to put powder in, especially if the cartridge has minimal body taper. So that's how you can get a cartridge like the 270 WSM to nearly match the 270 Weatherby Magnum in terms of case capacity, and at the same time also fit in an even shorter package. With a max length of 2.86 inches, fits in that short action rifle like I just talked about, same as the 308, whereas the 270 Weatherby and the 270 Winchester, the original 270 Winchester, both use a 30-06 length action. 
the 270 WSM is almost, but not quite as fast as the 270 Weatherby Magnum. It's almost the same, though, very similar to the dynamic we saw with the 300 Winchester Short Magnum versus the 300 Winchester Magnum. Plus, with the 270 WSM, that slightly fatter and shorter powder column is a little more efficient, and it possibly provides an accuracy, accuracy boost over the longer and skinnier powder column of the 270 Weatherby Magnum. And the 270 Short Mag doesn't need quite as long of a barrel for optimum performance. Now, like I said, 26-inch barrels are most common with the 270 Weatherby. And some rifles even have a 28-inch barrel when they put a 2-inch long muzzle brake on the end of that 26-inch long regular barrel. Well, Browning makes their X-Bolt long range in 270 Winchester Short Mag. It also has a 26-inch barrel, but that's more of an exception than the rule. 24-inch barrels are more common with the short mag. Most of Browning's other 270 short mag options have 23 or even 22-inch long barrels in the case of their quote-unquote compact offerings. Uh, Things are similar with Winchester. All of their 270 Winchester short mag rifles have 22 or 24-inch barrels. Now, I'm going to share some of the ballistics for the 270 short mag compared to the regular 270 and the 270 Weatherby here in a minute. But realize the 270 Winchester short mag provides a good boost in velocity over the regular 270, and it is almost up there with the 270 Weatherby. And like I said, that performance also comes in a pretty compact package. And since the cartridge is shorter and more efficient, you can get excellent performance out of a rifle that's not nearly as big. So for instance, with a Winchester Model 70 featherweight in regular 270, It has a 22-inch long barrel, 42.75 inches long overall. Now, that same rifle in 270 Short Mag has a 24-inch barrel and is 44.25 inches long overall. It has a a 2-inch longer barrel, but is only an inch and a half longer overall than the regular 270 Winchester. Now, the 270 Weatherby is not available in the Model 70, but... Weatherby makes a bunch of rifles in it. For instance, their Mark V Backcountry 2.0, 48 inches long overall with a 28-inch long barrel. 26-inch long barrel with a 2-inch long break on the end of it. So quite a bit bigger than both the 270 Winchester and the 270 Short Mag. Now their Mark V Hunter is 47 inches long and has a 26-inch long barrel with no muzzle break. So like I said, the 270 Short Mag is right up there in terms of ballistic performance with the 270 Weatherby, but you don't need nearly as big of a rifle to get that level of performance. And the 270 Short Mag also gives a tiny bit of an advantage with recoil sometimes too, compared to the 270 Weatherby anyway, because it burns less powder to get nearly the same velocity. Now I'm going to talk in more detail about a guy named Rick Jameson here in a minute. He was heavily involved in the design of the 270 Winchester Short Mag, and the patents that I'm about to talk about also applied to the 270 Short Mag, as well as all of the other Short Magnums that Winchester made and some other cartridges as well. He especially loves the 270 Winchester Short Magnum, and Nosler solicited a bunch of small, one-page-long columns from a number of different gun writers to put in their ninth edition reloading manual. Well, Rick Jameson wrote their column for the 270 Short Mag. Here is a excerpt from it. Little things add up. A shorter action by a little. A lighter rifle by a little. A shorter barrel by a little. A shorter bulk stroke by a little. It is easy to carry, quick to handle, and powerful. The 270 Winchester Short Mag performance is way out of proportion to its length. In a short action, it has no peer. It stands alone. End of quote. All right, that was from Rick Jameson. Like I said, we're going to talk more about him here in a second. Now let's talk about ballistics of the cartridge that I keep teasing you, and I'll compare it to the regular 270 and to the 270 Weatherby. Now, Winchester makes a couple of factory loads for the 270 Short Mag. For instance, they have 130 grain loading in their Deer Season XP line, 3,275 feet per second muzzle velocity, almost 3,100 foot-pounds of energy. Barnes makes a factory load with 140 grain TTSX at 3,135 feet per second for 3,056 foot-pounds of energy. You can also get 150 grain power point from Winchester, 3,150 feet per second for just over 3,300 foot-pounds of energy. 
And you can also get that 150 grain Nosler Acubon long range bullet I keep talking about at 3,050 feet per second for almost 3,100 foot pounds of energy. Now that's for all that I just talked about was for the 270 short mag. Now remember, we got that same 150 grain Acubon long range at 2850 for just over 2,700 foot-pounds of energy for the regular 270. And then for the 270 Weatherby, that same 150 grain Nosler Acubon long range at 3,080 feet per second for 3,159 foot-pounds of energy. So 3,080 feet per second versus 3,050 feet per second. The 270 Weatherby, 30 feet per second faster than the 270 Short Mag. And then you got the 270 shooting that same bullet at 2850 feet per second. So impressive ballistics for this little cartridge. Now, like I mentioned in the 30 caliber episode, there was a lot of drama associated with Rick Jameson and Winchester regarding all of the short magnum cartridges. It applied to the 300 short mag. It also applied to the 270 short mag and all of the other ones. Long story short, Rick Jameson, the guy I was just talking about, managed to patent a certain design principle that was utilized in the short magnum cartridges, basically the idea of a quote-unquote short fat cartridge like that. He wanted Winchester to license production of those cartridges from him, so he wanted to get a royalty every time that they produced rifles and ammunition using a cartridge using any of his patents. They didn't want to do that. They wanted to work out some other sort of deal with them. A lot of the details have gotten really blurred over time, and it's one of these things that a lot of stuff has been said about it, but there's not a lot of people around these days that really know what the heck happened. Long story short, they made a settlement, the details of which are confidential, and only Rick and the people at Winchester know what the details were of it. But it appears that after a lot of drama and arguing and going back and forth, they did manage to work out a royalty agreement where they were paying him royalties on that stuff. This applied to Winchester and Browning. As far as I know, most other companies did not want to deal with that. And so it took a long time, for instance, for Hornady to pick up all the short magnum cartridges. And they actually went out of their way with the folks at Ruger to design some other cartridges in their compact magnum line that were close enough in size to the short magnum cartridges that they could just modify existing tooling for rifles and ammunition to work with that new cartridge, but do so without having to pay royalties to Rick Jamison for doing so. Now, like I have mentioned previously, patents on cartridges themselves are very unusual. So are royalties associated with that. That's not how gun and ammunition companies normally make money. So, for instance, take a cartridge like the 7 Rim Mag or the 223 Remington. Um, Remington makes money off of those by making rifles and ammunition and components for them. But if Winchester makes ammo and rifles you know, for those cartridges, Remington doesn't get anything out of it. There's no, you know, Winchester doesn't pay Remington to, to use their cartridge names or vice versa or any of that stuff. They make it, they make their money by making rifles, ammunition, otherwise components, things like that. So this was very unusual, what happened with all of these short Magnum cartridges. And like I said, it's very hard to get good info on exactly what the heck happened with all of this drama between Mr. Jameson and Winchester. As far as I can tell, the patents that are related to these cartridges have since expired, which is why you see companies like Hornady and Nosler making factory ammunition for the 270 short mag and the other short magnum cartridges. But as you can imagine, though, when there's drama associated like that, uh, that makes a company not want to make rifles or ammo for a certain cartridge because they don't want to pay royalties for it, that is very bad for the adoption of the cartridge. And it almost strangled the entire line of Winchester short magnum cartridges in the crib. Even so, the 270 short mag is the second most popular of the short magnum family. The 300 Winchester short magnum is the most popular. And the fact that those two cartridges have really survived to this day, despite all of that drama, really is a good testament to show how good of performers both of them were. And it's interesting to think maybe about 
how would have things been different for the short magnum cartridges if all that initial drama wouldn't have been present at the beginning? And not only did Winchester and Browning get on board with it, but you had Remington and Hornady and Nosler and everybody else immediately jumping on these cartridges from the beginning. We'll never know exactly how popular they would be, but I'll bet they would be more popular than they are now. And they're still relatively popular. So like I keep saying, the 270 Winchester Short Magnum gives you basically everything that you like about the 270 Weatherby Magnum, but it does so with a little less recoil and it exists in a smaller package, doesn't require as long of a barrel. Ammo for this cartridge has been really tough to get over the last couple of years during the ammo shortage, but it is improving. Uh, this car- like this cartridge, like I said, it is very popular, not on the level of the 300 Short Mag or the 270 Winchester, but I will say it is probably more popular overall than the 270 Weatherby. You got a little bit more variety with ammo and with rifles for the 270 Short Mag than is the case with the 270 Weatherby, but not quite to the degree as the original 270 Winchester. But all in all, great cartridge, and I can understand why a lot of people really like it and like to hunt with it. Now, the next 270 cartridge came out just a couple years later in 2004. It's called the 6.8 millimeter Remington SPC. Now, the SPC stands for Special Purpose Cartridge. This cartridge is completely different from anything else we have talked about to this point. Now, you could file the 6.8 Remington SPC in the same category as cartridges like the 300 Blackout, 300 Hammer, and the 6.5 Grendel that are all designed to improve upon the performance of the 2.2.3 or 5.5.6 cartridges, but still function in an AR-15 or M16. Now, the shooting world has long been filled with stories of our brave servicemen and women shooting enemy soldiers with their M16s, only to have the bad guys shrug off the hit continue fighting and potentially killing or wounding Americans before finally going down after taking a lot more hits from the little 5.56 cartridge. Now, there were some stories like that from Vietnam, but serious and quite real reliability issues with the rifle overshadowed most concerns people had about the stopping power of the little 5.56 cartridge. Well, updates to the rifle largely fixed those reliability problems and combine that with the fact that The military changed ammunition from the very high-velocity 55-grain M193 round to the slower 62-grain M855 round. Those changes brought issues with the effectiveness of the 5.56 cartridge on enemies on the battlefield to the forefront, and they really came home to roost in the early 2000s when the war on terror really got started going in earnest in Afghanistan and Iraq. For those reasons, there was a renewed urgency for the task of finding a newer, more powerful cartridge that would function in the M4 carbine and the M16 rifle, yet still shoot accurately and have superior terminal performance. As a result, the folks at Remington partnered with some people in the Army Marksmanship Unit and started working together to build a new cartridge that used a shortened 30 Remington case. Now, this was a cartridge I mentioned in the 30 caliber episode that was basically a rimless... 30 caliber cartridge that was Remington's answer to the 3030 Winchester. It came along in the early 1900s, wasn't really popular itself, and kind of faded away. But they took that cartridge case, necked it down to shoot a 6.8 millimeter or a 270 caliber bullet. It was actually 277 caliber to be precise, same as all of the other cartridges we're talking about in this episode. Now, 277 caliber bullets split the difference between. 6.5 6.5 millimeter and 7 millimeter projectiles in terms of accuracy potential, BC potential, and terminal effects. So they make sense for those wanting a cartridge more powerful than a 223 that still functions within the tight constraints of the AR 15 platform. Now, as I have mentioned previously, cartridges must be 2.26 inches long or shorter and operate within a pretty narrow pressure window in order to safely and reliably function in an M16 or an AR-15. Now, the 30 Remington has a larger diameter case head, 0.422 inches versus 0.378 inches for the 223, but it's not quite so large as the case head used on the 7.62x39 or the 6.5 Grendel. This simplified the design of the 6.8 millimeter cartridge. All in all, this new cartridge performed pretty well in AR series rifles, and it only required a new barrel, a new bolt face, and some modified magazines. Their original goal was a 115 grain bullet at 2,800 feet per second for just over 2,000 foot-pounds of energy. 
However, let's just say that initial design was a little rushed and it encountered issues when initially submitted to the Army for formal approval. Now, they had some issues specifically with excess pressure. So because they were in a hurry, the folks at Remington downloaded the cartridge a little to reduce pressure. And and they did that instead of taking the time to do a more thorough investigation into the cartridge design and potentially make a change that would allow the cartridge to reach that goal of a 115-grade bullet at 2,800 feet per second without excess pressure. Well, they got the worst of both worlds by doing what they did, though. Even though that new load met pressure specifications, the military ultimately passed on it because it wasn't quite powerful enough for what they wanted to do. Now, that design received SAMI approval in 2004, and the initial load offered to the public fired that 115-grain bullet at 2,625 feet per second for about 1,750 foot-pounds of energy. Now, that was still a big leg up on the 5.56, right? It has about 40% more muzzle energy than that M855 load, but it was not quite what it could have been. Now, this cartridge had quite a bit of hype surrounding it. Heck, I remember reading articles about the quote-unquote new 6.8mm SPC back when I was a cadet at West Point. Those articles were all saying that this was the new hot thing that we'd be using in Iraq, and it was way better than the 5.56 cartridge, etc., etc. Now, some people listening to this podcast may recall that we used to have a federal assault weapons ban in the United States. Congress passed that ban in 1994, but it had a 10-year sunset provision in it. Well, it was due to expire 2004. The Bush administration and Republicans in Congress declined to renew or extend that assault weapons ban, so it expired. And there was a big spike in demand for new AR-15 designs after that happened. Everybody wanted a piece of the action. And since that 6.8 SPC design received SAMI approval, everyone buying rifles at the time in that chambering was buying a rifle with a chamber design that couldn't operate at full potential for the cartridge without excess pressure, and it had to use the downloaded ammo. So that is what the ammo companies had to produce. Nobody likes a cartridge that is hamstrung like that, especially when the very similar 6.5 Grendel, which did not have those issues, received SAMI approval a few years later. Well, some folks that really liked the 6.8 SPC and wanted to see it live up to its full potential made some minor design changes to the cartridge, and it mainly involved increasing freebore. This allowed the use of much more powerful 6.8 SPC ammo without excess pressure. Now, unfortunately, because there are now a bunch of older 6.8 SPC rifles out there using the old chamber design, factory ammo still has to be loaded down to those reduced specifications. Now, since that new chamber design came out, new production rifles will have a 6.8 SPC 2 designation. And when I say 2, I mean the Roman numeral for 2, so it'll say 6.8 SPC II. Now, new production rifles are going to have that designation. They can fully take advantage of the capabilities of the cartridge, which are pretty darn impressive. Unfortunately, you really need to hand load to take full advantage of this cartridge's potential, though, because like I, like I talked about with the issue with factory ammo and all those old chamber designs. Now, here's what I mean. Now, Federal and Hornady both produce a couple of great factory hunting loads for the cartridge. Federal offers it in their Fusion MSR line with either either a 90-grain Fusion soft point at 2850 feet per second, so about 1,600 foot-pounds of energy, or a 150-grain Fusion soft point at 2470 for about 1,550 foot-pounds of energy. Hornady has a 100-grain CX loading in their custom line, flinging a 100-grain CX at 2550 feet per second for about 1,440 foot-pounds of energy, or 120-grain SST at 2,460 feet per second for about 1,600 foot-pounds of energy. That's not bad at all. You can kill the heck out of any hog or deer out to a couple hundred yards with any of those loads. But like I said, those factory loads aren't bad, but hand loaders who have rifles with that 6.8 SBC-2 chamber can safely use much spicier ammo going 100 to 300 feet per second faster with the same weight bullet. The other really nice thing about the 6.8 SPC is that it does not need a long barrel for maximum performance, and you'll be close to the full potential for the cartridge with just a 16-inch long barrel. Now, it's not quite as good suppressed as the 300 Blackout, but it is still darn capable in that role. And really, this cartridge seems to have 
found a home among hog hunters because it excels in short-barreled ARs, even those that are suppressed, does not have bad recoil at all, and it just hammers hogs out to a couple hundred yards. I'm not exactly sure what ammo he uses, but no less an authority on hog hunting than Glenn Guess absolutely loves the 6.8 SPC. Go all the way back to episodes 39, 40, 41, and 42 of the podcast to hear more from him. As another side note, Remington also released the 30 Remington AR cartridge that I mentioned in the 30 caliber podcast around the same time, and that is another example of a cartridge with lots of potential that also just fell flat. Now, not much else happened on the 277 caliber front for another stretch of time after the 6.8 SPC from Remington came out, but then we saw another flurry of activity here much more recently. Now, the 277 SIG Fury hit the markets in 2019, and that was the next big piece of activity on the 270 caliber front. This is completely different from the 6.8 SPC. The only similarity is they both use similar sized bullets, and there was some initial involvement on both of them with the military. Now, the 277 SIG Fury uses a revolutionary design that enables the cartridge to operate at very high pressures. Now, typically... 65,000 PSI is the max pressure that brass cartridges and modern small arms can safely handle. The new 277 Fury designed by SIG has a whopping SAMI maximum average pressure of 80,000 PSI. Now they were able to do that by building the cartridge with a steel case head and a brass body. SIG originally designed this cartridge for submission to the U.S. Army's Next Generation Squad Weapon Program, and they also released it in late 2019 for civilian use in conjunction with their cross bolt action rifle. The cartridge received SAMI approval in 2020. Now, the big deal here is that the 277 Fury is delivering ballistics almost identical to the old 270 Winchester, but it does so out of a 16 inch long barrel. Now, remember that two, the old 270 typically uses 22 to 24 inch long barrels. And the 277 Fury also does this out of a short action cartridge. Now, yes, SIG and the Army both finally decided to move away from AR 15 size chambers here. This opened things up quite a bit for further innovation. So the 277 Fury is very, very similar in size to the 308 with an overall length of 3.825 inches. Now, SIG advertises that this cartridge will shoot a 135-grain bullet at 3,000 feet per second or a 150-grain bullet at 2,900 feet per second. Remember, that's out of a 16-inch barrel and with a much smaller case than the old 270. Now, that ridiculous pressure of 80,000 PSI, and that's about 23% more than the 65,000 PSI used by new hot rod cartridges like the 7mm PRC, is how they do that. That new case... With a steel case head is how they built a new cartridge capable of handling that pressure. Now, brass has certain advantages for use in cartridge design, but steel is a little bit stronger. So by making a multiple piece cartridge with a brass body, but a steel case head at the base of the cartridge where pressure is going to be highest, they're going to take advantage of the greater strength of the steel at the case head to contain those really high pressures, but at the same time have the rest of the cartridge case made from brass that is easier to work with and also just a little bit more malleable and will function a little bit more reliably in firearms too. So the idea is they're getting the best of both worlds. This idea is literally some new cutting edge stuff. The army is in the process of testing out the cartridge along with a rifle and a squad automatic weapon using the new cartridge, and they're getting ready to field all of these systems. Now, they call the 277 Fury the 6.8 common cartridge in military nomenclature. Now, between those guns I just talked about and the new M17 and M18 9mm pistols, which are basically modified SIG P320 handguns that replace the old Beretta M9 or the Beretta 92, SIG is going hard at those military contracts. Now, because this is such a new cutting-edge round that's using new technology that we haven't really seen before, I'm expecting there to be some major teething issues along the way. But I will say, though, there is lots of potential here, and this could be a revolutionary new design development that in 20 years, maybe 
maybe all the cartridges are going to use something like this, and that will completely change the way that cartridges are designed, the performance that we can expect out of them, that sort of thing. I personally have heard a lot about the 277 Fury, but I have never actually shot one myself. Shoot me an email, john at thebiggamehuntingblog.com, if you have a SIG Cross rifle or any other rifle in that chambering and can share some experiences using it in the real world, especially while actually hunting. Okay, so that all happened in 2019, early 2020. Next up is a cartridge that also came on the scene right around the same time, the 27 Nosler. Nosler rolled it out at the 2020 SHOT Show. Now, this is the most recent addition to Nosler's line of proprietary cartridges. It joined the 22, 26, 28, 30, and 33 Nosler. Like all of those rounds, except the 22 Nosler, the 27 Nosler uses a 404 Jeffrey case necked down, it has a rebated rim, and is shortened to fit in a 30-06 length action. However, the folks at Nosler didn't just make the 27 Nosler a speed demon. It is a speed demon, but there's more to it than that. They also built it with a faster-than-typical rifling twist rate, and they introduced a special new high VC bullet to go along with it. Now, this is what I was referring to earlier with the original 270. Let's go back in time a little bit to the 270 WSM 270 Weatherby. Now, while those cartridges were indeed commercially successful, many felt that the 270 WSM cartridge in particular didn't live up to its full potential. This is because it suffered from the same limitations as the other short-action Magnum cartridges designed around that time, like the 7mm Remington short-action Ultra Magnum and the 7mm Winchester short Magnum, in that it used a design focused solely on higher velocity instead of heavier and more aerodynamic bullets. Specifically, the 270 short mag used the same 1 in 10 inch rifling twist rate as the original 270 Winchester. That twist rate worked fine for bullets in the 130 to 150 grain weight range most popular for the two cartridges. Now, while those bullets are outstanding for many hunting applications, they don't quite offer the sort of extended range performance more and more hunters and shooty, shooters are looking for these days. Shooters and hunters have started to place a much higher emphasis on long, heavy, and aerodynamic projectiles in recent years with the rise in popularity of long-range shooting. In response, the various ammunition manufacturers have started to work on things to satisfy that demand with offerings using sleek, low-drag bullets. Nosler Acubond, Acubond Long Range, Barnes LRX, Hornady ELDX, and the various Burger bullets are all great examples of extremely aerodynamic hunting projectiles that have really taken off in recent years, especially in 6.5 millimeter, 7 millimeter, and 30 caliber. Unfortunately, those slower rifling twist rates used by the 270 Winchester, 270 Weatherby, and 270 Winchester Short Mag held back development of those long, heavy, low drag bullets in 277 caliber. Now, all of those bullets are available in the different 270 cartridges, but their BCs are notably lower than comparable 6.57 millimeter and 30 caliber offerings. Well, the folks at Nosler built the 27 Nosler with a faster 1 and 8.5 inch rifling twist rate, and they also built a new 165 grain Acubon long range bullet to go with it. Now, the 150 grain Acubon Long Range, the 270, 270 Weatherby, and 270 Short Mag, all use, has a G1 BC of 0.591. That's a good BC, but that 165 grain Acubon Long Range has a G1 BC of 0.62. And by the way, the 27 Nosler can fling that high BC 165 grain Acubon Long Range at 3,158 feet per second for 3,653 foot pounds of energy. So let's compare it to some of those other loads we were talking about earlier. So 165 at 3158 for the 27 Nosler. You got the 150 grain Acubon long range, 2850 for the 270, 3050 for the 270 short mag, 3080 for the 270 Weatherby. So that's 78 to 308 feet per second faster with a bullet with a significantly higher BC for the 27 Nosler. And by comparison... That loading for the 270 has 1,484 foot-pounds of energy and 40 inches of drop at 500 yards. The 270 short mag has 1,734 foot-pounds of energy remaining and 34.4 inches of drop 
And the 270 Weatherby has 1773 foot-pounds of energy remaining and 33.7 inches of drop. We'll compare that to the 27 Nosler. It has 31.4 inches of drop at that range and still has over 2,100 foot-pounds of energy remaining. Now, that is comparable to the brand new 7mm PRC in terms of retained energy downrange, which is pretty darn impressive. So the 27 Nosler shoots flatter and is quite a bit more powerful than all those other 270 cartridges due to its design characteristics of one having that real, that long standard length action fat case like that combined with the ability to use those really high BC aerodynamic projectiles. I had a 27 Nosler and I liked it. It shoots almost like a laser and it hammers what it hits. But this is a pretty specialized rifle cartridge just due to the nature of it being a Nosler proprietary cartridge like that. So it's not super widely adopted. Um, only Nosler makes rifles for it as far as I know. And Nosler is the primary uh, manufacturer of ammo for it. Once again, you can get it from places like Hendershots and um, uh, Choice Ammunition, smaller boutique manufacturers like that. And that's actually where I was getting my ammo for a little while when I got the rifle but couldn't get factory ammo from Nosler during the worst of the ammo shortage. Now, Nosler just had some bad luck with this one, introducing a brand new cartridge like this and then immediately having the pandemic hit a couple months later and then just the next couple years being a giant mess of supply shortages and just obscene demand for ammo, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those things undoubtedly hurt the adoption of the 27 Nosler. This was probably never going to be a super widely adopted cartridge on the level of the old 270 Winchester. It was always going to be a more specialized cartridge with more niche appeal to people. But even so, what ended up happening with it, that was really all out of Nosler's control, put a crimp on things with it. Now, the work that went into developing the 27 Nosler and that 165 grain Acubon long range bullet, though, may be more important than the cartridge itself. This leads us to the next and the final cartridge we're going to talk about in this episode, the 6.8 Western. This cartridge came on the scene at the absolute worst part of the ammo shortage in January of 2021. I have never seen a cartridge receive such a negative initial rollout. But to be fair, those reactions were more likely a result of people's fragile mental state as a result of a year of the craziness that surrounded 2020 with the pandemic and everything else that went along with it, along with frustration with the ammo shortage at the time, more so than any issues with the cartridge itself. But my goodness, I am glad I was not working the social media accounts for Browning or Winchester when they introduced the 6.8 Western because they got a lot of figurative tomatoes thrown at them for every post about the 6.8 Western during that rollout in 2021. Indeed, I have never met anyone with a 6.8 Western rifle who did not like it. This cartridge is very similar in appearance to the 270 Winchester short mag at first glance, but it has more head height and a faster 1 in 7 or 1 in 8 inch rifling twist rate that lends itself to use with long high BC bullets. The flagship 6.8 Western load actually uses the same 165 grain Acubon long range as the 27 Nosler, but it just shoots it a little bit slower. You get a muzzle velocity of 2970 feet per second for about 3226 foot pounds of energy. Now, Browning also rolled out a 6.8 Western loading at the same time with a 175 grain Sierra Game Changer bullet, 0.617 BC. That bullet was going 2,835 feet per second for just under 3,200 foot-pounds of energy. Ballistics weren't quite as impressive as the 165-grain Acubon long-range ammo with that one, but it was still a really good load. Now, Brent Variel actually used that Browning loading from his 6.8 Western to kill an elk in Arizona that he told us about in episode 246. So go check that one out. That was a great episode, and the... 68 Western with that 175 grain Browning load did great for him. When you crunch the numbers, that 68 Western load has a little flatter trajectory, less wind deflection, and a tiny bit more retained energy and less recoil than a 168 grain Nassler Acubon long range factory load for the 7 millimeter Remington Magnum. Now, the 6.8 Western 165 grain Acubon long range load actually surpasses the 180 grain Acubon load for the 300 Win Mag in the energy department 
around 300 yards and also has a flatter trajectory and less wind deflection than the 300 Winchester Magnum out at 500 yards. And by the way, the 6.8 Western does all of that out of a short action cartridge. Plus, Similar to the case with Hornady's PRC rounds, the 6.8 Western uses a much more modern overall cartridge design than those older cartridges. This includes the 270 Winchester Short Magnum. John Snow wrote a fantastic article on this subject for Outdoor Life. Do an internet search for modern cartridge design and it will probably come right up. Long story short, companies designing new cartridges these days typically employ more modern cartridge design principles than incorporate best practices obtained from competition and bench rest shooters to obtain best possible accuracy with those new rounds. In addition to a faster twist rate, cartridges designed using these principles have cases with a long enough neck to support those longer high BC bullets, can seat those long high BC bullets to the SAMI specified maximum overall length without intruding into the powder column, they employ minimal body taper, they headspace off sharp shoulders, and they have a chamber design with a snug throat. Taken together, these design principles result in cartridges with a very high degree of accuracy potential, especially at extended range. So the 6.8 Western is a super cartridge with great external ballistics that also has wonderful potential for accuracy. Really, the only complaint I have ever heard about the 6.8 Western is ammo and rifle availability. Winchester and Browning are the only major companies that produce ammo for it at this instant. Hendershots does not produce 6.8 Western ammo as I record this, but Choice Ammunition does. And they have a couple different 6.8 Western loads with several different bullet types to include some from Berger and Nosler. Now, Browning and Winchester were the original manufacturers of 6.8 Western rifles. They still make them. Uh, Christensen Arms, Fierce, and Seekins Precision all produce 6.8 Western rifles too, as I record this. Now, things seem to be a little better on that front now, but that 165-grain Acubon long-range loading was especially difficult to find for a long time. And during 2022 in particular, I received an earful from hunters who bought rifles in 6.8 Western in anticipation of using that hot rod 165-grain ABLR loading that, that Winchester in particular was really advertising heavily saying things like, hey, you need to buy our new rifle chambered in this new hot rock cartridge so you can take advantage of the incredible ballistics offered by this factory load. But they couldn't get ammo for it. And those people were understandably very frustrated that they couldn't get factory ammo with the awesome loading that they specifically bought that new rifle in that new chambering to use. Now, I'm sure the folks at Winchester were doing their best here, but it was just a crazy time with like I said, just incredible demand for ammo, all of that stuff. They did roll out a couple of other loads, like a 162-grain copper impact, 170-grain power point, and a 170-grain ballistic silver tip factory load for the 6.8 Western. This was in addition to the original 165 and 175-grain loads from Browning and Winchester. And as good as those loads may have been, people didn't want that new ammo as much as they wanted the original stuff, especially the 165-grain Acubon long-range loading the cartridge was originally marketed for. As good as the 6.8 Western is, it is living in something of a limbo right now where a lot of hunters aren't quite sure what the future looks like for it. Nobody wants to buy a rifle chambered in a new hot rod cartridge only for the manufacturer to discontinue production of rifles and factory ammo just a couple years down the road. On one hand, I can understand why people don't want to use something, especially something new, that is uncommon. On the other hand, a lot of people have to start using that new cartridge for it to become common. And once it becomes common, then other manufacturers are more likely to pick up the production of rifles and ammo in it. And at the same time, if something becomes common, it's more likely for the original manufacturers of it to continue production of it. Now, unfortunately for the 6.8 Western, The fact that it competes in a similar market segment as the 7mm PRC from Hornady is a big strike against it. However, while the 6.8 Western did not get off to as big of a roaring start as the new 7mm PRC, it does seem to have really found a home in a particular segment of the hunting community. And the fact that it outperforms the 7mm rim mag with a little less recoil and the fact that it also fits in a short-action rifle are important advantages in its favor. We will see what the future holds, but I think the fact that the 6.8 Western is a true short-action cartridge will be what saves it in the long run. 
More to follow with this, though. Now, the last few years have been pretty interesting. We got the first 270, the original 270 Winchester back in 1925. The next one came along 18 years later in 1943 with the 270 Weatherby Magnum. The next one came 59 years after that in 2002 with the 270 Winchester Short Magnum. It took 77 years to get the first three 277 caliber cartridges. Well, we have received three new 277 caliber cartridges since just 2019 in the 277 Fury, the 27 Nosler, and the 68 Western. Now, this bore diameter was never really quote unquote dead, right? I mean, the 270 Winchester was going to be around for a long time anyway. But like I mentioned, there didn't seem to be a lot of new innovation going on with it for a long time. Now that this bore diameter seems to have risen from the dead, figuratively, especially with the development of, of a bunch of new high BC bullets, I would not be shocked to see more development along those lines in the future. Maybe we will, we will see continued tweaking of the legacy cartridges with faster rifling twist rates to use those higher BC bullets like the 165 grain Acubon long range. Maybe we'll see some other new cartridges come along as well. Who knows? Maybe we'll see a I don't know, a, a 27 Creedmoor or a 27 PRC or something like that with a new 155 grain ELDX instead of the 145 grain ELDX that Hornady uses in the regular 270 right now. So who knows? This could be a very exciting time to be a 270 bore diameter fan. In any case, stay tuned as always, and I will keep you appraised of any new developments that come along. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel right now and hit that like button. Just click on that thumbs up button and the red subscribe button below the video to make sure you don't miss out on any of my new videos about hunting gear reviews, cartridge comparisons, cartridge profiles, stuff like that. I've also put links below the video to articles I've written about some of these cartridges as well as some of my favorite pieces of hunting gear like slings, ear protection, scopes, rifles, ammo, stuff like that. For more detailed information on popular hunting cartridges and what they're best suited for, click the other link in the description below or go to huntingguns101.com to get that free ebook I've written on the best hunting cartridges. Now I'm going to turn it over to you. Have you hunted with any of these 270 caliber cartridges? If so, which one? What game have you successfully taken with them and what ammo and rifle did you use in each case? Let me know by leaving a comment on this video right now. And also, feel free to leave a comment with requests for other cartridge comparisons you'd like to see in the future. Thanks for watching, have a great day, and good hunting.